So I figured I'd start by giving you a little bit, tell you a little bit about myself, um, since I'm still somewhat new here and I haven't had the privilege of meeting all of you yet. Uh, I grew up in California, the first eight years in Southern California, and then most of my life was in Northern California. And for the past, like, we have Northern California fans, all right. Um, so for the past, like, nine or ten years, I was in San Diego. And more San Diego fans, I love it. I've been a Christian pretty much for as long as I can remember. My mom got saved when I was uh, really young, and I've been connected to the local church ever since. But it wasn't really till high school that my faith became a real thing. I played a lot of sports growing up. I was real active um, in that. And when high school came around, kind of music kind of crept in there in my high school days as well. And to make a long story pretty short, uh, it was through music that God kind of got my attention. Right? I fell in love with playing in a band and singing to God. And it was through that time in high school that I learned about who God was and what that actually meant to me. It wasn't just about like the faith that you know, the church that I went to or my mom's faith. It actually it was God personally to me. Uh, right out of high school, I started working for the church. I think I was like 19 when I started working there. I was doing youth ministry. I even did some kids ministry. And of course, I started uh, leading worship. I was terrible at first, but I jumped right in, and, and God was faithful in that. And to be honest, I haven't stopped since. And uh, I'm 36 now, which is weird to say. Um, married to my beautiful bride, Carista, for uh, almost five years now. And it was about maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, we were living in San Diego. We felt kind of God stirring in our hearts a little bit. We felt God was calling us to be open to new adventures, to get out of our comfort zone, uh, and to trust Him. And that brought us here. And uh, I am definitely out of my comfort zone at this very moment right now. So. <laughs> Um, we're excited to be part of this family, and God is, God is for sure faithful. Um, this morning, I wanted to talk about worship, and I want to talk about, I called it authentic worship, and um, God put it on my heart to talk about it mainly because, you know, I figured that being the worship leader, you guys would be somewhat interested in seeing and hearing what God was teaching me about worship. So, uh, I picked Romans 12 because I think it has this unique perspective in regards to worship and the gospel and living as followers of Christ. And so let me read it again. It's, it's fairly short. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So I see this in kind of three parts. I want to break it down. Uh, the first one is mercy. Right? It starts right away with, I appeal to you, therefore. Now, I was taught that if you see the word therefore, you have to ask. What is the therefore, therefore, right? And so what we see is the writer of Romans, Paul, he is appealing to us on the basis of what has gone on the first 11 chapters of, of this book of Romans. And I think what he's setting up is this first 11 chapters is, is kind of the new Christian life is what it's going to be built upon. Paul sums it up in this verse. He says, uh, the mercies of God. Right? God has been merciful to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I think Paul is encouraging us to build our lives on this mercy, really sink our roots into this mercy. Our new life will flow out of this mercy. That is, what's coming up, Romans 12, as he's going to finish the rest of this chapter, is going to become the new reality of our life. It oozes with mercy. I'll read a few highlights the rest of the chapter. Show mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Give to the saints. Bless those who persecute you. Weep with those who weep. Associate with the lowly. Repay no one evil for evil. Never avenge yourselves. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Paul appeals to us to build our lives on mercy and become merciful. But what I want to focus on with this first verse is that before Paul just continues on with verse, uh, the, the rest of the chapter and describes our new Christian life as being merciful, he first describes it as worshipful. And before you think the Christian life has everything to do with being merciful to others, we must first realize that it has everything to do with being worshipful towards God first. Before we give ourselves away in mercy to man, we must give ourselves away in worship to God. 
So the next piece of this verse I want to break down a little bit is what Paul means when he calls us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so I want to reference uh, Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 18. You can turn there if you like. I'll put them up on the screen here. By the way, I think there should be some Bibles over there. If you need a Bible, you know somebody who needs a Bible, grab one. Those are free. We're we're a church who believes in the Bible. Go get it. Take it. We will replenish them. <laughs> I promise. So let's, let's read this together. Hebrews 10, 11 through 18. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for the first, sorry, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he describes Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So the gospel proclaims this truth, and this is what we know. Jesus, who, again, Paul described as our Passover lamb, was the final sacrifice for sin because it was perfect and sufficient for all who believed. A few years back, um, my pastor at the previous church, we did a, a few sermon series on the Old Testament and its relation to the gospel. He called it uh, the gospel according to, insert Old Testament character. So it was like the gospel according to David, gospel according to Moses, Abraham, Ruth, Jacob, etc. What I learned during that series studying the Old Testament brought the Old Testament to life for me. You know, it wasn't just like these cool Old Testament stories and characters that I learned about as a kid anymore. It was part of this arching theme connecting to the New Testament. That was mind-blowing to me. You know, it's all pointing back to this one moment in history. Now, you see, we recognize now what the Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to. They were pointing to the cross. Before Jesus entered earth to become our perfect and sufficient sacrifices for all, temporary sacrifices were made. And I believe... God was giving us an understanding of what sin meant to the world, and that's the separation from God that needed to be atoned for. And this is where those living sacrifices came in. I believe God was communicating to us that the atonement for sin is death, and the beauty of God's love is displayed through Jesus on the cross because referencing back to Hebrews 10, verse 12, said when Christ had offered for all time, did you catch that? a single sacrifice for sins. Did you catch that? He sat down at the right hand of God. So Christ brought an end to these Old Testament sacrifices for sin, right? He finished this great work of atonement. His death cannot be improved upon. We do not add to it. All we have to do now is trust him for that great work. So when Paul says in this, in this first verse of Romans 12, present our bodies as a living sacrifice, we understand he's not talking about sacrifices for sin anymore, right? Christ did that. It's done. So what does he mean? I think Peter makes it really clear. In 1 Peter 2, 5, he says something very similar. Are spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God? Then he adds these words, through Jesus Christ. So it's because of Jesus that our sacrifices to God are acceptable. So what does that mean for us? And this is that third part of Romans 12 when we break down. That's, what, that's worship. And here we are, right? And this is kind of that application part of the, the, the talk here this morning. Uh, my pastor growing up used to say, and I always knew he, was, he got to the point, he was finished with it, and it was time for application. He said, so what? Now what? I was like that. Uh, so what? What does that look like for us? What does that mean for us? Now what? What do we do now? Right? So I want to give you three points. Three is a common number in my message this morning. I want to give you three points of what I hold on to when I consider my acceptable sacrifice or what I'm going to call this morning authentic worship to God. So the first point is this, object. This is the why of what we do in worship. 
Who or what is the object of our worship? And can I be real with you? This is where I struggle the most, honestly. It is so easy for me to make my worship all about the experience. Let me explain. I love what I do. I love that I get to sing for a living and that someone wants to pay me for it. The coolest thing ever. <laughs> right? I love the feeling that we have after we're, you know, we're, we're done singing at the end of the day and just this family. And I love it. I love the experience we have. Um, it makes me feel awesome. And that's great. I hope you enjoy that as well. I hope that feeling never goes away. But I must remember that it's not about the experience. Because what happens if the, if the music stinks, right? The experience can sometimes be ruined, but it's not about the experience. When I make the object of my worship about the experience, I'm missing the mark. Because when it gets down to it, the heart behind making it all about the experience is a selfish ambition. One of my favorite authors, Pastor Louis Giglio, uh, describes this so well. He says this, it's not the elements of our worship that are awesome, it's the object of our worship who is awesome. Now, I've heard this principle relate to faith as well. I'll give you a quick story. Um, when I was a kid, I rode my bike everywhere. I loved riding my bike. And I was always looking for things to like, jump off of. There were some like dirt dunes and stuff that were behind this cool park. I used to go there all the time, jump my bike. It was the coolest thing ever. I remember one day very clearly, um, I decided for whatever reason, I wanted to make my own ramp at the bottom of my driveway. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this already. <laughs> so I found an old skateboard deck. It didn't have like the trucks or the wheels on it. It was just an old deck. And I was looking around, I found some old bricks. And they're, they weren't these like cinder block bricks you build a house out of. These were like the little red bricks you build like a chimney out of. They were, yeah, they were old. So I went down to the bottom of the driveway, I stacked up maybe three, four, five bricks, and then I gently placed the skateboard deck at the right angle. So I stepped back and I looked at it and I thought, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> I had visions in my mind, I was going to hit that ramp, catch some major air, stick the landing like a pro. So <laughs> I hiked back to the top of my driveway, grabbed my bike, and with full confidence and faith, hopped on my bike and charged down the driveway towards the flawlessly built, perfectly safe bike ramp. <laughs> the ride down the driveway was flawless. I had perfect speed. My approach was dead on. And just as my front wheel hit the ramp, I learned something. <laughs> I learned that an old skateboard deck resting upon some even older bricks does not make the best bike ramp. Predictably, the ramp crumbled as soon as my front wheel hit it. My bike went this way, I went that way, and hit the ground pretty hard, <laughs> knocked the wind out of me. Yeah, but I got up, mostly just my pride was hurt, but I learned a very valuable lesson. And I learned that the amount of faith we have does not matter as much as what we put our faith in. Does that make sense? Good. Let me illustrate that with... Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said to his disciples, you've heard this before, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus told his disciples that the amount of faith isn't actually the point. It's what your faith is placed in is the point. And this translates back to what we were talking about with worship, right? the object of our worship, and this is why it's so important that God is the center and the reason always for our worship. So the second point is of authentic worship is posture. So I have a, I have a video I want to share with you, but first I want to give you a little backstory. Um, a few years back, my pastor uh, asked me if I could do take on like a new project. Um, he told me he wanted to give people in our church an opportunity to share and tell their story. So I was always really fascinated with um, filmmaking and editing and stuff, and I've always wanted to have an opportunity to learn how to do it all myself. So I asked him, like, well, what if we do, like, a video series, and I can, you know, buy cool equipment and new cameras and stuff. And so, uh, so he said, yeah. And so we called this series uh, One Hero. The tagline was, our stories are many, but we all share one hero, and that's Jesus. 
So I want to share with you one of the uh, one of the videos, one of the stories I did. Um, now this is from my previous church, so don't mind the Mission Trails Church uh, branding and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, you can hit the lights, and this is uh, David's story. Check it out. I've been going to Mission Trails Church for four and a half years. I grew up in a Christian home. I was raised by my dad, who was a pastor, and my mom, who was very involved in the church. Uh, my brother and I learned to believe in the Bible and uh, try to follow Christ with all our heart, soul, and mind, and um, tried to let our actions show who we were as believers. I always assumed that if I uh, followed Christ and did all the right things that good things were going to happen. Everything was going to go my way. So when I joined the Navy and things were going really well, I uh, went to trial for the SEAL program and uh, I was doing better than I'd ever done anything else in my life. Uh, I thought that I was doing the right thing. I was serving a noble cause and uh, trying to still read my Bible and uh, follow Jesus, minister to people around me, and I thought, wow, you know, I found what I was supposed to be doing. I found God's purpose for me, and uh, that was it. I thought that's what I was going to be doing for a long, long time. In 2011, October 15th, uh, right before my first deployment, I decided to go parachuting with a couple of friends. did one jump, everything went fine. On the second jump, when I was coming in for a landing, my canopy stalled, you know, I was about 80 feet up, and I uh, ended up breaking my back in the fall. Uh, left me paralyzed, and right away I knew that my Navy career was at least postponed for a very, very long time. And it definitely wasn't gonna be what I thought it was. I started to really wonder if God really did have my back, and maybe there isn't any real order or purpose for me in this world. Uh, I really started to, for the first time in my life, question my faith, and you know, by far the biggest trial I had come to in my life, and a dark time. After about a year of um, feeling sorry for myself and um, being real confused and uh, just really doubting my faith and God's love for me and his plan for me. My now wife uh, essentially was like, you know, even if you don't really know that God loves you and has a plan for you, he does. And it's funny that it'll never leave my mind. I was like, I'd rather trust that God has a plan for me than not because, you know, not trusting him is not working out too good for me. And it's a scary world without knowing that somebody big he's got my back so I didn't really know where to start Janice said just start reading James so that's what I did I dove into James and just kept going from there and reading and uh, praying and trusting that God did have a plan for me and that I didn't have to know what it was for it to be real and to be there and uh, it wasn't gonna be what I thought it was but there was a purpose for my life 2 Corinthians 12 9 says my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. It was kind of funny because now, five years after the accident, I look back and the things that I was really good at, I was a strong, you know, brave soldier and was excelling at that part of my life. And I was like, what everybody else thinks. God's going to use my strengths for his purpose. But now I'm, by any measure, uh, weaker. And God is using that for his purpose. So God doesn't have to use my strengths. He can use my weakness.
Isn't that a cool story? Yeah, I love that guy. Love them both. Really proud of him. A friend of mine, Pastor Trey Van Camp, said this We make it more about excellence when God makes it more about dependence. David's story reflects that faithfulness of God. You see, David was fully expecting to, you know, make it all about God using his own strengths. And rightly so, right? But God, through his faithfulness, even after David's accident, you know, God's using David's dependence on him to use David's weaknesses for God's own glory. That's the faithfulness of God as we depend on him. It was all about his posture. It's all about obedience, dependence. And David took on that posture, dependence on God, because God cares more about our heart's posture. I think about um, Psalm 13. Psalm 13 is, is another, it's another David, a King David. Um, it's David lamenting to God. It's crying out to God. And believe it or not, this is, this is one of my favorite hymns. Not hymns. I told myself not to say hymns. This is one of my favorite psalms. It feels so authentic to me. It always has. I see the compassionate heart of God letting David pour out, you know, his heart to him. But I see his strong sovereignty as well. You know, this this confidence as as David trusts God at the same time and crying out and saying, where are you? Let me read it to you. Follow along with me here. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lift up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I love that the psalmist, David, did not shy away from lamenting to God because he approached him with the right posture, right? You see, even in his lamenting is worship to God because his posture is that of dependence on God. He is trusting that God is the one who can save him. He's recognizing that God is all that he actually needs. And then you see it in the breath of hope that David has in verse 5 and 6. He says, but I trust in your steadfast love. So it's David's posture of dependence we can learn from here. A posture that I strive for, strive to have, is this idea of, of worship as a lifestyle. I think of it as authentically having room in our hearts for both joy and reverence. And practically in our lives, I think it looks like this. Submission and response. Think about Psalm 95, 6. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. You see, the psalmist tells us to literally bow down, even kneel down in submission as a response to who God is. That's the Lord our Maker. So that is the third point of authentic worship I want to hit on here. It's, it's response. And this leads me to the role of music in our worship. Now, maybe you've heard this you, or you've experienced this when someone says, I love to worship. You kind of automatically a little bit make that connection with they love to sing. They love the singing time that happens on corporately. And, and we know that's, you know, singing doesn't equal worship. Worship doesn't necessarily equal singing. But here's my take on it. Here's why I think it's an easy connection for us to make. I view music um, as a, I view music as the most common and shared way as humans of connect, uh, like communicating our emotions, right? There's plenty of ways to communicate our emotions, but I think music is that most universal of, of these languages of emotions. Consider uh, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So you see in this verse, the author encourages us to use music as a way to communicate the thankfulness of our hearts. And have you ever thought about this? I shared this with the the men's group maybe months back, but we didn't invent music. You thought about that? We we discovered it, right? It's science. 
I think it's so wild. God created it. It's the coolest thing. And I believe he created it for the purpose of this universal emotional language, this language that breaks through cultures and, and age and gender, any kind of barriers whatsoever. And it's to be used as this response to his glory. Right? God reveals his glory, and our response is worship. And singing is this beautiful gift from God that he allows us to use in worship of him. So, uh, kind of reviewing these three points we talked about of authentic worship or object. You know, are we making sure to keep God as the object of our worship? Posture. Are we making it more about excellence or dependence on God? And the third one is reverence. Sorry, response. Are we responding authentically in both joy and reverence? So apparently this is a very short message this morning. <laughs> and I want to close with this. It's this mindset of worship evangelism. You know, people are searching for God, right? We know this. I think people who are searching for God are looking for an encounter with God. You know, something that's real. The church is where they should find it, amen? I think those who are searching for God are hungry to see evidence of God working in our own lives. And I'll reference one of my favorite authors, Louis Giglio, again. He says... Whoa, my page has jumped. There we go. He says this, Worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who he is and what he has done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. I'll sum it up like this. If we view worship as a lifestyle, then our lives become a tool for evangelism. And this is where the rest of Romans 12 connects with our worship becoming a lifestyle, right? Remember, I was talking about how, how it's just like oozing with mercy. We respond by living a life built on mercy, just as God has poured out mercy upon us through Jesus Christ. We live this life now because we've been shown mercy, to show mercy to others. Let me close with this, uh, a picture of the church living in authentic worship. Acts 2. Starting verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Let's pray together. God, what an amazing, what amazing opportunity to be able to come before the Father the creator of the universe, with such confidence, knowing that you are all that we need, knowing that the, the, the creator and sustainer of the universe cares about each of us. Thank you, Lord, for this um, amazing gift that you allow us to enter your throne room, to experience you, uh, together, I especially thank you for, for these opportunities on, on Sunday mornings as we gather as a family, uh, uniting our hearts and our minds, our attention upon you, to giving you the worship that you deserve. God, help us. Help us to constantly be, be looking to you, looking to Jesus and the cross and making that the object of our worship and to be approaching you with this, this posture of dependence upon you and God, free us up to respond to you, to have courage and faith to respond authentically, God, in submission, faith in you. God, again, thank you for these moments. We love you as we, as we sing together, as, as the ushers come forward and they, they, uh, they pass the baskets as we continue with um, a heart of worship, giving to you in offerings and tithes. Um, I pray for this church. I pray for this city, this community. God, you would be at work and that it would start here and now within our own hearts. This, this like ground zero of us giving over our attention and desires to you and trusting you. Thank you, Lord, for these moments. Pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.